I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and co-owner of PurePleasureShop.com. I'm April, VP of the cutting-edge sex toy company, Hot Octopus, and I dedicate my life to the business of sex. We are on a mission to teach you how to have hot sex, deep intimacy, and how to make your own rules for who you are as a sexual being. Welcome Welcome to to the the Shameless Sex Revolution. Don't forget to head on over to our website, shamelesssex.com, for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Shameless Sex Podcast. This is your Friday episode. If you didn't know, now you know we are doing two episodes a week. We figure maybe you all have more time on your hands and we have lots of wonderful speakers that we'd like to share with you. Uh, This is a repeat guest, Dr. Nan, who was actually on our show not that long ago. I want to say it's episode 146, but I could be wrong. Um, And we instantly fell in love with her and she knows her stuff. She's a cognitive neuroscientist, a licensed psychotherapist, and she wanted to come on our show to talk specifically about anxiety. And I know that during these times, there's a lot more anxiety in the air. And she also discusses how it applies to sex and relationships as well. Um, so we feel like this is a good episode for uh, probably all of us to take in in this. He's going to be like a regular guest on the show too. So yeah. if you have questions and you're, you love Dr. Man, Nan, Dr. 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 Nan, Man. as much as we do, Dr. Man, uh, you can send us a, a question for Dr. Nan at contact at shamelessx.com and we will make sure that we uh, at least give her the opportunity to answer sex questions. Um, hopefully she'll be a repeat guest once a month. That would be amazing. I love her. Awesome. Yeah, if you do that in the subject line, please say this is a question for Dr. Nan so that we know that. Otherwise, it will get lost in the many emails that we get uh, for sex questions. We love receiving your sex questions. We're so grateful. Um, and also... April, you want to tell them about our Instagram lives that we're doing these days? Oh, yeah, I would love to. Actually, we're going to go live. We're recording this on Friday morning and we go live every, every Friday now at 12 p.m. Pacific time. We have some um, ability to either answer live questions or you can pre-send us your sex questions and we will answer as many as we can. We usually do about 30 to 45 minutes right now, but please tune in, check us out. We are there for you. We're trying to give you more access to information that can help you and your sexuality and your uh, self-isolation. We're also giving away some free vibrators actually on today's IG Live. So this uh, is pretty exciting. A hundred free vibrators, vibrators. I hope I can talk. I hope I can talk today. A um, hundred free vibrators from Hot Octopus and it's first come first serve. We will tell you how to win on the IG Live. So it's, it's really easy though. I'm so excited about that. It's me too. And if you're helping everyone, if you don't hear this podcast before then, because you may not, we are also doing other free vibrator giveaways in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Next, next week on uh, Instagram live, we're giving away free bottles of Uber lube to next Friday. So just stay tuned and make sure that you follow us on Instagram at shameless sex podcast. And then also just listening to our podcast that you find out it's, it's a time where we need more pleasure. And I think Nan says that on this episode, she's like, this is the time we, we need more pleasure and more joy and to find ways to have that in our lives. Absolutely. And pleasure is something that probably gets lost sometimes. It's actually been lost a little bit for me. I have uh, almost ceased my masturbation practice, which was pretty regular there for a while. And my sex life is is okay right now. It's it's uh, definitely not as vibrant as it had been in the past because we're all in my household just a little bit more stressed out. So I'm working on that too. So let's all work together on pleasure. Mm-hmm. And uh, Amy, I don't know how your pleasure is going in your world, but sounds like you're doing all right. Self-pleasure practice isn't what it, what it probably could be. Um, but when I'm with my partner, my, my pleasure practice is pretty awesome uh, when we have our time together. And I'm really grateful for that during these times to have that. I know a lot of people don't have that right now. Um, and so I'm definitely counting my blessings, you know, feeling really grateful to have that. And I like, we, we did an episode, it's not on the area, but with um, Eve Minax, who said, she's like, 
I wasn't feeling horny, but I still forced myself to masturbate yesterday because I knew I needed that as medicine. And that might be where we're at sometimes right now to know that we get those feel good endorphins and that connection to our body and not just being in our heads about all um, the fear and things that me, me, not everyone's feeling that, but if some people are. Um, and so sometimes we need to kind of set that time and not like force ourselves, but like to really just create that time and to kind of almost like fake it till you make it so that you can feel that connection. I wanted to tell you, Amy, and I guess all of our listeners, because I thought this was really, it it frustrated me. Yesterday, I was watching an episode of Ozark, which I don't know if you watch it, Amy. It's like on its third season. I've watched it since the beginning. Uh, It's with Jason Bateman. But there was this scene on the episode I watched yesterday. I think it was like episode five, where uh, there's the girl is having um, sex or, or they are like kind of trying to get intimate for the first time with uh, one of the character's brothers. Anyway, he was unable to get an erection because he was on um, medication for being bipolar. And he and she was like, and he's like, it's not you. And I was so sad because she turned over and was like, fuck you and, oh, and basically shamed him. And I was like, no, people are watching this and thinking that it's not okay to be able to, uh, if she wasn't aware of his medication, right? Um, and so she took all this blame and he was like, I think you're beautiful. And I was like, I, I'm so bummed that they couldn't have turned that scene around into, hey, maybe your penis doesn't have to go into my vagina. Maybe we could get down in other ways. And it was like end scene, right? And then he stopped taking his medication because he said it like fucked with his whole, you know, normal body uh, ability to uh, connect with the world. And and then he was able, you know, the next time they 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 hooked up fully and and I just was bummed. I'm like, well, I want to change that, like that perception because people watch that and then they think, oh, if I'm in a, a, a hookup session with a penis owner and their penis isn't able to go in, you know, or function how I think it should, then it's over and it's my fault. I'm like, no, that's not true. There's so many other options for you out there. And I mm. wish sometimes mainstream media would cooperate with uh, what we're trying to help people understand. Unfortunately, mainstream so. media, I think, is one of the main contributors to a lot of the shame that we have, whether it's porn or just mainstream media, te- television and shows and things. And that's why we have a job and we're here to hopefully inspire some um, thinking outside of the box of what you're seeing in those realms. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And um, I have seen... I almost little... called you. I'm almost like, God damn it, Amy, you got to watch this scene. Fuck it, yeah. I'm going write to write to the <laughs> creators of Ozark and give them a piece of my mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, you ready for a sex question? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's a shame piece that comes up with this. So it's a good, it's a, good, it's a yeah, very fitting. I love listening to your podcast and I've been tuning into your Instagram lives. I feel a lot of shame towards my kink. I get turned on watching penis owning folks pee. I have only recently started telling folks I'm hooking up with about it. And the last two were very receptive when I told them about it, but I don't know how to take it further and have them try it out, try out my kink with me. How do you suggest bringing it up to try with my current partner? I I thought this, this when I saw this question, I like, I I flagged it. I was like, love this. Yeah. Because like, I mean, we love all the questions. We get a lot that are about, you know, like desire and communication. And this is about all those things too. Um, And I think it highlights when we're talking about shame here and how people, again, like, you know, they probably have seen some episode of something with someone being like, ew, you like pee? That's gross. You know? And, um, and, I want to offer to everyone our motto here in the, in the sex positive motto is that all consensual sex is good sex. Meaning that as long as you have consent for it with yourself or with whomever you're playing with, that it's all good. Um, there's certain things that are limited from that because it's not consensual. Um, and not everyone's going to be into your kink or your desire, right? Just because we like something doesn't mean other people should like it, but it's not helpful when they shame us for liking it. And it's people shame usually when they are uncomfortable, when they're uneducated about it, maybe they have their own trauma about it. Um, and so what's helpful here, if you have someone that shares with you and says, Hey, here's my jam, I'm into, to pee play or golden shower play, or what do they call it? Water sports, um, is another name for it. And you're like, ooh, yeah, that's not really my thing. But thank you so much for sharing that with me. Like, I feel honored that you actually are opening up. I know that's kind of scary to share. And I'm not really interested in exploring that. Or, huh, I've never thought about that. Maybe maybe we could try it out just like in the shower and see how that feels. And I'll let you know how that feels. Um, But not going, 
ew, that's gross. What's wrong with you? Why do you like that? That's not normal. Because then these people go and they closet it and they build up these walls and they end up wanting to hide themselves, kind of like what April's talking about in the Ozark episode, where all of a sudden, you know, he's like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I'm broken. I need to, you know, change myself to fit in with the world. Nope, there's my dog. Shit. Sorry, dog's barking. It happens now these days. Um, so anyways, the question here for this person isn't, is it normal? It's how do I take it one step further and share my kink dog, attack dog with my current partner? And what I would say is to preface it with vulnerability to say, hey, there's something I want to share with you that's really hard for me to share. And I have shame about it. Like to just be honest about that. I have shame about it. I haven't shared it with a lot of people. I've shared it with maybe a couple of people and they were responsive. Uh, but I haven't really explored it yet. And I kind of have a desire to explore it, but I'm not sure if it's your jam. Here's my thing. And just to say that with vulnerability, uh, and you're not saying in a way like you need to try it with me or there's something wrong with you if you don't, but just like, here's something that I'm interested in. It's really scary for me to share this. How do you feel about it? If you're not into it, like all good. But if you are open to exploring it with me, then that would be really fulfilling for me. Um, and now you deal with the issue, of course, like if it's something that is a deal breaker, like you absolutely need it to feel fulfilled, then, then you have to reevaluate the relationship. But I think incorporating the vulnerability and speaking to the fear and the scary stuff first about why um, this is a scary conversation and then sharing what your desire is um, kind of is the gold. And then if they respond with shame, then you got to reevaluate, do you even want to be with this person? Or then you share how that shame felt for you to receive and hopefully they can own that. Yeah, I like that, Amy. I was going to also suggest the shower piece because that's sort of an easy way to access that desire and in a way that's not as maybe shocking if the person is really um, not necessarily into it or not sure if they like it. Be like, hey, what about dressing this in the shower? And another part is when that Eve Manax episode airs, that's the perfect episode, I think, for this listener to, to tune into because Eve makes this great association of soup because I would talked about vanilla, um, being vanilla. And, and she was like, no, you know, I'm not really keen on calling things vanilla when people use the term vanilla. She's like, I like to think of, of sex or kink and terms of people like soup. Some people might like a, a really bland uh, kind of, what was the chicken chicken noodle soup? Or um, I can't exactly remember her Minestrone. association. Minestrone, yeah. Minestrone. And some people might like a gazpacho or a clam chowder. And some people might like a clam chowder with peanut butter in it. <laughs> and so you never know about even some of the soup options that are out there until perhaps you are exposed or maybe your partner can uh, push your boundaries a little bit to help you explore something new. And you might find that you love that gazpacho that you never even tried to taste because you're like, ew, cold soup. Yeah. Gross, right? However, fucking cold soup might taste great to you sometimes. And shifting, changing, and obviously uh, maybe tapping into someone else's desires are a great way to not only explore your own sexuality deeper, but then have a even deeper connection with your partner. So the vulnerability pieces is awesome too. I highly, yeah. highly suggest that as Amy said, because coming, uh, how, how would you, you know, if anybody came to me and was like, Hey, I'm really scared to tell you this. I, I, can you just take a minute and listen, I want to share this with you, but I've never talked about it really, or I've only shared it with a couple of close friends and I'm afraid of judgment. And will you just carry an open heart if I tell you this, of what I'm, I'm into and what I really desire. And I mean, I could only imagine nine times out of 10, you're going to get it. Of course, I, of course I'm, I, I would, I would love to, to listen. And, um, I, I would, I would definitely, um, feel that way if someone came to me instead of either hiding it or never talking about it. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to say if, if you're a hard no, you can say a hard no lovingly. There's a way to lovingly still create a shame-free space, but just be like, you know what? Yeah. When I check in with myself, I'm getting a no to that. But again, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, and I'm open to you know, discussing. Maybe we can watch some some pee porn together. You know, Maybe there's other ways to explore it that isn't you know, with my body. And I'll just out something with myself. I've had a, um, a lover share that they had a uh, golden shower um, desire or fetish that they have they had ex experienced exploring and that they wanted to, they were curious how I would explore with them. And and I said that I would try it with them. And we did try it in the shower. Like I did try that out with them in the shower. And 
Um, and in it, I felt but somewhat neutral, if not a little more like, hmm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting a hard no, but I'm not getting like a, this is really my thing. I'm not turned on by it. It's more so like I'm doing this for you. And so I shared that later. I was like, you know, I'm not, not instilling shame in you here. It's just, I, I'm, when I check on myself, that's not really my jam. Um, I might be into doing this on the occasion with you, but it's not really something that I'm getting a yes, I'm being a regular thing. It was, I, I mean, I think that they felt pretty good about that. So that's just how negotiation goes. And, you know, us all honoring our own yeses, nos, and maybes. And like April said, trying out the soup that you may not think you like, but if you're getting hard, no, don't try it. I agree. Should we bio. jump into the show and read Dr. Nan's bio here? All right. I love Dr. Nan. And I mean, her credentials are just, they're amazing. I mean, beautiful. So here we go. Nan Weiss, PhD, is a cognitive neuroscientist, professor, licensed psychotherapist, certified sex therapist, board certified clinical hypnotherapist, and certified relationship specialist. After almost 20 years in clinical practice, she became driven to understand how the brain creates moods and behaviors in relation to sex and other aspects of human experience. Having returned to academia to pursue a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. She's now a cognitive neuroscience researcher at Rutgers University, Newark. She's the author of the book, Why Good Sex Matters, and has contributed her expert opinion to outlets such as National Geographic, The Atlantic, Time, Glamour, Women's Health Magazine, The Washington Post, Huff Post, Romper and Bustle. She's also been on the Today Show. To learn more, visit AskDrNan.com. That's Ask Dr. Nan, and you spell out doctor. So A-S-K-D-O-C-T-O-R-N-A-N.com. But first, here's a message from one of our amazing sponsors. Our amazing sponsor today that we handpick ourselves is My Girl Fund. So as you all know, sometimes it's hard to meet sexual partners in real life, especially this day and age. And porn really doesn't offer you that erotic intimacy that you might be looking for. Say hello to MyGirlFund.com. My Girl Fund allows you to form virtual relationships with amazing women from the privacy of your own home. On MyGirlFund.com, you can meet, message, share photos and videos, and cam with those women anytime, anywhere. We did our research and we stand behind My Girl Fund as they actually empower the women who work there where they can set their own rates and choose exactly who they want to work with. It's safe, private, and discreet for everyone. And to support people who are trying to make ends meet right now, especially because we're all at home, they're giving $50 bonus to all women who sign up during this month, which is April 2020. When they reach $500 in contributions, you get $50 in bonus money. So you can join by going to mygirlfund.com for free. And for a limited time, you can become a lifetime premium member for less than $5. You just have to go to mygirlfund.com slash shameless. That means you our amazing listener, get discounted credits and bonus interaction features for life for life when you go to mygirlfund.com slash shameless. All right, let's get to Dr. Nan. And I got to tell you, it works so well. When I went on, I swear to God, when I want, went on the Today Show, I wasn't the least bit nervous. Hmm. Oh, no. I shocked myself. Wow. That's I awesome. Was, I was so relaxed. I was having the best time. I was mm-hmm. like, what the fuck happened to me? Mm-hmm. I didn't need a Xanax. I wasn't like, you know, I, I was just, and it's because, you know, if you do it long enough, if you work with that, your nervous system, it's really about learning how to harness it. So I think that I'm just going to st- st- state right here that we should start the podcast with what you just said that when you went on the Today Show and you weren't nervous and didn't have to take Xanax and just we can segue in right from there. So we're already recording and okay. because okay. I think that that's already a great example of what we're going to talk about here and um, and you and you have I mean you're a licensed therapist and you have personal experience with this on ways to manage anxiety and. I know that anxiety, I mean, and depression both are so common um, for all folks, often, you know, everyone experiences at some point in their lives, at least with anxiety, but probably some forms of depression. Can you 
start by sharing with our listeners and welcome Dr. Nan who's been on our show before and we'll have you again and again because we love you. April and I, after we had you the first time, we were like, we love Nan. And actually I had other people, other listeners, they emailed me like, I love Dr. Nan. So, um, I love you ladies. And it's Jill, and Jilly loves you too. It's a very mutual. Ah, yeah. Yelling. We all have, a, all have our lap dogs in our laps right yeah. now, which is yeah, amazing. Very calming. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm sure you'll share too, which you said on our last podcast that, you know, the animal therapy is really helpful. Can you start though with sharing with our listeners what anxiety is? How does it affect the body? I mean, what does this look like? Anxiety is a wired in function of the nervous system. So the reason why we have it is it functions. It gives us a sort of like we worry, therefore we prepare, we protect ourselves. And we're wired that way. But when we have too much of that wiring, it's such a thing as too much of a good thing. So about 20% of the population has a diagnosable anxiety disorder. We were having um, increases in anxiety. Depression is now the number one worldwide cause of illness and disability. We have been struggling for a number of reasons with even more anxiety up, you know, even prior to this challenge with the coronavirus. So our bodies are wired to have a fear reaction, which is something right in the moment, something coming at you and you get afraid of it for a good reason to try and get away, get away from it. Where anxiety is a, is more of a, anticipation of danger or loss or anything like that. So why we're feeling so much of it now is the panic system, panic grief system that's wired into all animals and people is designed to get activated when we're afraid of being separated from resources, whether the resources are loved ones or our food or shelter our everyday lives. So right now it makes perfect sense that we're feeling triggered into that, what's called the panic grief. It also happens to be the sadness system, which is actually the other side of the more upbeat, joyful care system, which is where our uh, the good feelings we get through our connections, like our puppies, our bodies release all these good natural opioids to soothe us. So right now it makes sense that we as a culture, because we are threatened from our everyday resources or access to those resources to be feeling a lot of anxiety, which is different than fear. Fear is more immediate. Anxiety is more of what's going to happen. Am I going to have enough food? Am I going to have shelter? Am I going to be able to, you know, make a living? All of the stuff that we're all very appropriately concerned about. And I'll say, this is a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say it's a great opportunity, if we actively cope now by staying put, staying put and not exposing ourselves or each other, this virus will flatten. They've been very successful in other countries with that between testing and people sheltering place, all we need to do is sit tight for the next, whatever it takes, weeks, you know, month, whatever. The virus will remit. And this is an opportunity since we are sheltering in place for us to really, since we can't do our everyday business the same way, for us to use this as an opportunity to reboot our system so that we can be more relaxed, healthier, more creative, more enthusiastic, more connected with ourselves and each other than before. So I see this as, you know, the, the gold, the, 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 what do they call it? The, um, the, 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 the benefit, you know, the gold in the dust here mm-hmm. is our ability to really, you know, reboot our system so that we are really going to set ourselves up not just to survive this, but to thrive this and to take it as a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? How do we manage this? The first thing that we need to do for the nervous system. And I can tell you this from someone who had her first panic attack at the age of about 21, right after I graduated college. Sorry for the phone is ringing for no apparent reason. Phones happen. Um, Yeah. So, but I have had 
such a predisposition to anxiety, my whole family and my credibility story, which is why I can say as a therapist and a scientist and an anxiety sufferer that this stuff really works is right before I, before we had this, you know, shutdown with coronavirus, literally the week before I was interviewed on the Today Show by Maria Shriver and I wasn't the least bit anxious. I didn't have where I used to get where I would feel trembly, where I would feel like my heart race, where my mind would go blank. I, I didn't take, I didn't bring any Xanax with me. I always have Xanax in the house just in case. It's good to have, but I didn't even use it. I didn't even think of it. I have just been practicing these tools and they're not really like you got to sit there for, for like an hour or two or three to meditate. The things I'm going to talk about today with you guys are things that you can bring throughout your day that become just sort of like second nature. And the first and the most powerful thing is the silliest, simplest way is just extending your out breath a little bit longer than your in breath. So if you breathe in for a count of four, one, two, three, four, and it's good to do it through your nostrils, you exhale for the count of five or six. All out the nose? If Mm -hmm. you can, because when you do an in and out of the nose in yoga, they call that ujjaya breath Mm -hmm. because it makes like an ocean sound. Mm -hmm. What it does is it kind of triggers a soothing reaction. It's called the vagal break. Your heart is innervated by the vagus nerve. And when you breathe like that, what it does is it slows down the heart, which triggers, you've heard of the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the calming, restorative portion that's responsible for sexual arousal. Paradoxically, it's the calming portion of the nervous system that allows us to be sexually aroused because, you know, with guys, when they get anxious, you know what happens to their penises. Mm-hmm. They kind of like, Ugh. so yeah. the, the calming portion of the nervous system is how you can trigger to your body to relax. And when we're relaxed, we're actually safer because mm-hmm. we can pay better attention we're better problem solvers. We're better planners. So a long, smooth inhale. One, two, three, four. And then exhaling. One, two, three, four, five, six. And if you do that, every time you think about it, okay, just breathe. One, you know, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. It sounds like, what could that really do? Well, I'll tell you, it will train your nervous system so that the quieting component becomes strong and it's going to over, or just completely change your chemistry, completely change your chemistry. So that number one, I'm going to close the door Wait, here. Dr. So Nan, question, hold on, on that, on that one in particular. So before you did the Today Show, did you do this? like in preparation or did you do it during your interview or all like if time. folks it's all just the time. I teach it so much that it's in my body. So I'll forget. And then I'll realize, uh oh, you know, I'll feel the tension and and really paying attention to the way your body is feeling from moment to moment is the key part of listening and learning from those wired in emotions and being able to work with them rather than being run by them. So I'm sitting in the green room, okay, which is where you go in. And I'm looking around and I'm like, I did this and I added some of the energy locks that I do with yoga. And I'm going to have directions for those on my website. I write about it in my book, which is pulling up on the floor of the pelvis, the kegels. And I'm doing that. And then they, as they call me in to go get my makeup, I see Kate, Kevin Bacon in the corner of my eye. And I'm like, damn, I wish I would seen him before I would have gone talk to him. I was just having the best time. And this is, I am the kind of person that when I knew I had a public speaking engagement, I would like be worried for like the month before. You know, and I, I remember when I was 50 and I was in graduate school and I had to do my first 
um, like year long lecture about my, the eight minutes to justify my graduate program. I had the Xanax tucked into my bra in case. Mm -hmm. And that was always like, I just expected I would be nervous because anytime people would look at me and I was up on stage or I had to produce something, I would feel it had absolutely no autonomic arousal. I was happy. I was attentive. If you look at me on the show, I'm like, my God, I look like I was, you know, I didn't get nervous even looking at myself after the fact. I was just so relaxed. So that's something that you can do. So folks out there that are feeling powerless or overcome from the situation right now, or they're feeling trapped, they can just take, they don't even have to set aside some time. If you just focus on your breath, do the, do the, the four in five out or however many that, counts feels good until you relax. Too. Yeah. And I, you know, it's funny. I used to teach meditation to cardiac patients. One of my gigs and you know what? You can't get them to do that. They have time for the heart attack, but they wouldn't do 45 minutes or an hour meditation. And guess what? I don't like sitting that long for meditation. So what I learned was like, actually, I, it, this all started for me at Harvard's Mind Body Institute in the 90s, where I learned these little minis, they called the minis. And what I did was my own version of them, which is the ex, because of being the neuroscientist who understands physiology, how that simple action of extending the out breath changes your chemistry. If you keep doing that and you thread that through your day, you're going to downregulate the stress reaction. And it, it, it'll take a couple of days and then you'll notice, wow, you know, you'll start to feel it. And when you feel it, it's like you're more attuned to your body. And then you'll notice more when you're not breathing well. And you'll notice more when you have tension. So it's really tuning into the body channel. And the body is very smart. Very, very smart. Well, I, what I keep thinking about here, I mean, and, and we're talking about just anxiety in general. So we're talking about, um, you know, anything that brings anxiety. So right, these stressful times with, you know, the virus and survival and all those things. And then also you linking it back to, to sex, you know, I'm, so I'm curious, maybe you could comment on this, you know, if someone is experiencing, because you're talking about, you know, erections, erect, a lot of erectile issues, as we know, are not necessarily like a blood flow thing, just a physiological thing. It's, it's the process, it's anxiety, it's, you know, the psyching yourself out, I'm not going to get hard, I'm not going to last long enough, etc. Um, so, applying these tools to erections, I think you know, what people call premature ejaculation or to other folks who just have a hard time orgasming, I'm not going to orgasm. Um, does this tool, is this something that people would implement you know, before being intimate and during intimacy too? Would this help? Exactly. So anytime that we get into our mind, whether it's our anxiety about what's happening with the coronavirus or whether it does our body, does my body look good enough in this angle? Or if you have a penis, is my penis going to stay hard? Am I going to come too fast? Am I not going to come at all? Anytime you go into your mind and you're not in touch with your sensations, what you're going to do is run the risk of your mind having its way with you and dialing up the anxiety and getting you out of your experience. So that's why this tool is so ubiquitous. It's so helpful. It's like really about just signaling to the body that we're safe. The, the body can relax enough where you can pay attention, whether it's to sensations in your body, which makes sex and life much more sensational. You know, our minds are great, but we really need to take them back as a tool as opposed to being you know, constantly pulled by the ruminations and the anxieties or the distractions that we're having externally, which are really wreaking havoc, which is why we've been so anxious to begin with, is the way we've been using our attention with all of this, you know, the devices and the, what they call the continuous partial attention poison for us. That's when we're constantly waiting for the next uh, notification, the next ding, the next phone call, the next like on social media or whatever it is that comes in. So what I was saying for people to what I wrote this piece from my website about how to cope 
with the corona, the coronavirus is number one. First thing we do, get up in the morning, instead of turning on your devices, you know, chances are if there's anything you need to know, you'll know it already, you know, give yourself 15 minutes to wake up, have a cup of coffee or tea and talk to another human being about what's on your mind, what's on your body, what's your emotional weather. And if you don't have somebody in the room with you, if you're alone, if you're, you know, if you're isolated, get somebody on the phone and talk to them or take or use, you know, an audio visual tool and actually look at a person and talk to a person because we don't do enough of that. We're always side by side in this, like everybody's on their devices. Nobody's even looking at each other in the room anymore. So the first thing we need to do is get up in the morning, have that cup of coffee, and then move our bodies, okay? 15 minutes of moving the body. If we do one thing differently than we've done before, if we get out in the sunlight, twice a day for at least 15 minutes, we're going to change the chemistry of our bodies and we're going to fix a lot of mood issues, hormonal issues, weight issues. We don't get enough natural sunlight. A major health problem that contributes to stress and mood, we spend 90% of our lives indoors. And without light getting into the back of our eyes, which goes directly to the hypothalamus, light from the back of the eye goes to the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus manages everything, every kind of process from our wake sleep to feeding to blood sugars to metabolism to sexual behavior to moods, everything. So if we develop that habit, getting outside twice a day, what has saved me is that we've been walking. I've spent more time walking in outdoors in this past two weeks than I have in probably the whole year before, you know? So that's one way we can change our lives, get some light. If you can't go out, go by a window and open the light and and get the light into your eye. So that's really, really big and really important. And that's more effective than actually eating a vitamin D supplement, right? People yeah. are like, well, I'm taking vitamin D. Yeah. The sun, you can't reproduce in a supplement. And you know why we're all depressed and miserable and stressed out and fucked up is that we're not getting enough natural light to begin with. Yeah. That, you know, house lights don't do that. That's why we're all so fucked up. Mm-hmm. We spend way too much time. So, you know, it's, we can't really have ca- the cabin fever right now because we're not stuck in the cabins. Mm-hmm. Cabin fever, people were stuck in cabins because of bad weather. They were literally, we are not really socially distanced. We're really physically distanced. There's no reason why you can't go out and walk and move your body and get sunlight. And you know what? You'll start to feel more calm. And then you can put things into perspective in a way that then I say, we need structure. And how can people structure? Years ago, Stephen Covey, who wrote the seven effective habits of the, of the effective Highly person, effective people. Yes. I love that book. It. There was one tool that I learned from that book that I use. And that's the way to like kind of do the quadrants. What is urgent and important? What's, own, what's important, what's just urgent, and what's neither. So if you set that up every day, like your executive decision time, and you make sure that you count something as both urgent and important that's going to be pleasurable for you, and you get extra points if it includes moving your body, you know, doing something with another human being somehow, we need to prioritize that kind of what I call healthy hedonism, things that feel good and are good for us. And it could even be, you know, binge watching something you love. As long as you decide that that's a priority and it's going to give you pleasure, you know, this really has to be almost like the cash register back right now, because I'll tell you from a lifelong sort of history of living with my own anxiety, oh, I could tell you stories and it runs in my family. Everybody has that first panic attack. 
I always had trouble relaxing enough to have pleasure, would feel guilty about, you know, doing things for myself. I flip it around now because I know that it's almost like it's what I've had to kind of learn to teach others is by finding the joy, finding the pleasure, finding the fun, finding and engaging our play systems, you know, the playful system that we actually, we become better balanced and better decision makers and more effective. And we're actually doing ourselves a big favor in the, in the biggest of pictures and everybody else also for that matter. What would you say? I think I asked you this before in the last podcast and I just, I feel like we can't talk about it enough or reiterate it enough because, okay, so I'll speak up for myself. So my best way in April and is the same too with, with, you know, meditating, which involves a lot of that, of the calming of the system. I use a lot of breath meditations. I think April does too. My best mornings are I wake up, I don't look right at my phone. I do get up, I go and I do my... Right now I'm doing a saltwater gargle because of the virus. I'm having lemon water and I'm making coffee. I sip my coffee, I sit and I meditate for 15 minutes. And after that, then I can go and look at devices and things. We live in Santa Cruz. So April has a balcony and I have a yard where I can get sunlight. Um, I do my work for a couple hours, then I go and get exercise. And those are my best mornings and I feel much better throughout the day. And when I don't, sometimes I don't choose that though. I'm like, I know what's best for me, but I'm not going to choose it. And then I'll get in a pattern where for you know a week or two, I'm not meditating and I'm not doing the thing. So your advice again to folks who in their minds are like, I know what I should do. I know what Dr. Nan says. I know what's best for me. I keep getting in my own way and not doing it. What do you have to say to, to those folks? So what is it, something that'd be helpful for them to move through that? Amy, that's a great question. I'll tell you one of the best answers I ever learned actually came from a yoga book written called The Heart of Yoga by Desika Char that I, in 2000, in the year 2000, I I did a yoga teacher's training for me to learn it deeper and also share not the yoga so much, but the learning and breath and all of that. Going off the path is part of the path. So as soon as you recognize that you've gotten away from the path, without being in reaction to it, without making yourself wrong about it, just kind of go, okay, all right, come back to the path. And what I would say is the way that we can get ourselves back to the path is by tuning into this is the practice that I'm suggesting for people. Every day, what's on my mind What's in my body and what's my emotional weather? That practice will help us get clearer about what's really happening. And the part that's really going to be transformational is what's in my body. Because what my book is about is really how the embodied emotions hijack us. Because at the top of the mind, we, we know, oh, it's good to meditate or it's great not to smoke two packs of cigarettes and drink a bottle of vodka every day. You know, we know what to do and what not to do, you know, but unfortunately, the top of the mind, the, you know, the, the executive functions, the neocortex can't basically undo when the core emotions and old habits are really hijacking us. So when we're off the path, just as soon as we know it, notice it. If you just tune in, you go, what's going on in my body? What's going on in my mind? What's my emotional weather? And when you spend time doing that, you're on the path because really the meditation is to, to be able to be attuned, right? The breathing is being able to tune into and, you know, just get our bodies back to their own natural balance, which they know how to do. Okay, time for a quick break. This podcast is made possible by OMGS.com. OMGS is a research-based online program that teaches you all about how to pleasure the pussy. OMGS studied thousands of vulva owners to find out how they orgasm and then made tasteful and inspiring short videos to show you techniques on how to pleasure yourself or another vulva. I've been recommending OMGS to my clients for years and has changed their lives. 
So for all you vulva owners or vulva lovers out there who may already be having good orgasms and you want to take it to the next level, or perhaps you want to explore more variety in your playtime, OMGS will have something just for you. With two seasons, one all about internal and the other all about external techniques, it's better than any book or DVD money can buy. To learn more, visit omgs.com backslash shameless. Our listeners get $5 off. Check it out. This podcast was also made possible by Uber Lube. It's a luxurious silicone lubricant great for all kinds of sex. It's less likely to throw off the pH than most other lubes. And there are hundreds of doctors who recommend Uber Lube to their patients, whether they want to make their hot sex even hotter or for folks who are experiencing dryness. You never knew lube could be this good. So whether you're an avid lube lover or you've never used lube before, Uber Lube is right for you. It has no flavor, no scent, and feels absolutely amazing on the body. Uber Lube has endless uses. I use it to tame my hair frizzies, to prevent chafing, and I even put some in my mouth right before an oral sex session, and it totally ups my blowjob game. Oh, and the bottle, it's gorgeous. It's totally discreet and looks more like a beautiful cosmetic product, so you can even leave it on your nightstand shamelessly. To learn why we think it's the best lube on the planet, check out uberlube.com. Use code SHAMELESSSEX and you get 10% off and free shipping. That's uberlube.com. Go check it out. And now back to the show. Yeah, I love that. I think that, that's that's super helpful. So your advice would Something. be like, Go go ahead, April. Yeah. Um, something that I that came up, Nan, that we're talking a lot about anxiety, and something that I felt like I wanted to share with you and with our audience is that I went through like this severe depression back in I think it was December, and I could not get out of bed. It was like I I, I knew I had things to do. I it was triggered by a slew of different events and things, and and I was so hard on myself, beating myself up about I need to meditate and I need to journal and I need to do this. I knew what may, would make me feel good, and starting was something so small as getting outside was one thing that helped me. I would just try to to get outside and walk for, and I'm an active human. I love working out. And sometimes I know for other folks out there, I mean, I don't want to speak for you as well, but I know how difficult it was sometimes just to do that. But it's the littlest things and the littlest shifts and anxiety. it, it, It can go hand in hand with depression, but I wasn't anxious. I was just low and feeling un, not worthy of the world and thinking like, what is my purpose here? What am I even doing? And the one thing is just not beating yourself up and just start with the small things. And if you don't accomplish all of those things in one day, it's okay. Tomorrow is a new day. And I, I just wanted to share that because it's it's awesome when you know what, what helps you. And it's awesome to hear experts like you share share these these tools and techniques. It's also sometimes just so hard to do. And right now, speaking of the world is, is in such a weird space, right? We're, we're not allowed to leave our homes. It might be difficult for someone to get out of bed. So start small and, and, don't, and, and don't be hard on yourself if, if one day you don't do all of these techniques or even one of them uh, and then just start over. But getting outside, I think, is the first step. The sunlight, even if it's cloudy, the rain, let it hit your face. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it'll help you wake up. April, that was beautifully said. And sorry that you went through that depression. And you know what? Depression is sort of a normal human experience that we don't allow in our culture. We have a very little, like we let, like you should be like sort of just within a certain range of how you feel. You know, life is catastrophe. Bad shit happens. We have losses. We have tragedies. We're going through now collectively something that's really a, you know, it's a catastrophe for many, many people. This is going to be a catastrophe. Some of it will be fixable. Money's fixable. You know, health is not, you know, when people get sick. But, you know, sometimes depression is a reasonable reaction to a number of unreasonable circumstances. And when that system is triggered, that's part of the panic grief system, by the way. It's the same system in the core, it's like a very core emotional system that, you know, one of the best um, pieces of advice that I got, um, and I would get anxious to the, so anxious that I would get depressed because she went out of steam. You know, some people are more depressive to begin with or more anxious. And it's often like related because she get depleted in any, any case. And 
What's common to both anxiety and depression is anhedonia or the inability to have pleasure. So one of the things you've noticed is that the most important thing is when people are in that depression uh, system, the self-talk is critical, meaning that it's, it's sort of like a negative self-talk. And by learning to be very mindful. What's on my mind? What's in my body? What's my emotional weather? And sometimes we just need to rest at the bottom of the well. John kabat who's the guy who brought meditation to the medical community in the 80s, years and years ago, I went to a training and he said something. It was all these doctors and, and psychiatrists and And psychologists and everybody's crying, days and days of meditating, everybody's, and he says, sometimes you just got to be at the bottom of the well. And actually depression and grief and sadness connects us all. It's the human experience. So what I like to tell people when they're in any kind of challenge is the same thing I tell myself all the time. And this comes from Ericksonian hypnotherapy, which is like um, probably one of the most incredible tools to help people is that when you get in touch with telling yourself that you have all of the resources internally to create everybody and everything externally, what we realize is that A, we have a lot more resilience and resourcefulness Like beneath the surface mind, when we're more calm, we can be more creative and that we need to connect with and through other people to access the external resources. We're not alone. So even though people, when they're depressed, sometimes they're so, their seeking systems are so flat. Remember we talked about the seeking system. I don't know if we, last time, which is dopamine fueled. Mm -hmm. gets us motivated, gets us into the world or gets us literally enthusiastic about getting our other needs met. When the seeking system is flat and the panic grief system is activated, you're sure to end up in a depression. So sometimes what we need to do is to rest at the bottom of the well, letting other people know we're there, you know, And one of the things that's really key is that, you know, I think part of why people don't speak as openly about depression as anxiety is we don't learn to tolerate other people's feelings. And so, and people don't learn to tolerate their own feelings. So everybody's like, get so triggered by people's anxiety and their depression instead of just going, wow, that's amazing. Tell me more. Or like hanging out with somebody. And usually what's underneath depression is some very, very potent grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's shame in depression. I felt so, I felt embarrassed. I'm like, what do I have to be depressed about? I'm such a, I I feel so privileged. I live in this amazing community. I have wonderful friends and, and, and that's the, the, the negative self-talk though, that also channels into, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't be feeling this way. So I love that Dr. Nan. I love just absolutely what you offered and kind of how you put, help put that into perspective, hopefully for other people out there. And the bottom of the well thing is a really great way to, the, to put it because you almost have to experience this darkness to, to feel the light when the light does reenter what? your life. And it just, and you have to realize that there will be an end to the depression. And um, hopefully some folks can, can get there on their own there's wonderful therapists and doctors out there that can also help. And, and if it sometimes it takes medication, right. And that's okay absolutely, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whatever it takes. I'm a big fan of whatever it takes. And if we weren't so fucking prudish about talking about depression, we're prudish about talking about everything. Everybody wants to be like sort of seen in a certain way. And you know what? Life is pain and we all suffer And no matter how good we have it on, you know, like whatever variables we want want to measure, our internal experience, our wiring is just core. Like if we are triggered in the sadness system and flat and seeking, we're going to feel psychic pain, psychological pain. That's the source of the psychological 
or psychic pain, whether it's mostly because of our chemistries or a combination of the chemistries and experiences. You know, being able to be honest about how bad we feel and have somebody tolerate that and just hang out with us there. My work became such a joy for me when I finally fucking figured out that it wasn't my job to fix anybody. And I would hang out there with them no matter how bad it was, how much pain they were in or how angry they were or how triggered. And I would just like learn. And this, I thank my teachers, my Gestalt trainer, uh, Dr. Uh, Brad Blant, who wrote the Radical Honesty series, to tolerate the sensations in the body that go along with our emotions in terms of what we're what we're thinking at the top of our heads and how we're experiencing it. To be able to hang out with another human being like that is such a fucking privilege. And I mean, like, and people like when they, when they see that you can tolerate their feelings, they can tolerate their feelings a little bit more. And then we can get sad enough to get over it, mad enough to get over it, scared enough to get over it, horny enough to get over it, whatever, appreciative enough to get over it. And then life is just, you know, again, about being in the moment, Mm -hmm. being, you know, in that moment with the other human beings. I think a lot of what we're experiencing right now with uh, coronavirus um, is uh, a lot. I mean, it's funny because it's not funny. Funny is the wrong word. We're confronted with death. And so, and yet we're experiencing so much aliveness because we're feeling so much. I mean, some people are numb, I'm sure. Plenty of people are probably numb because it's really intense or, um, or it's like, you know, a coping mechanism. But I think with what you're saying is like part of this human experience and what April was saying, you know, part of being able to feel all the good is we need to feel all the emotions and that's the heavies and the intensities. And that means we're alive because we're feeling all of it, but it can be really overwhelming when we've been maybe potentially conditioned to think that we shouldn't feel those ways. And it, the aliveness is so intense, the, you know, the pain and the struggle and the he- heavies and the lows. Uh, and, and yet when we realize it, like that's actually part of being alive. Uh, and it's, it's, just a, it's a wild time right now. It's a very wild time right now. And I think one of the most wonderful things that are coming from this is the recognition of the really what's really important, you know, is really our wellness, the people that we love and we care about, that we are human beings are as much as we're tortured souls, homo dysphorus, man with bad mood is the way that Marty Seligman, who is the founder of positive psychology called, you know, called us because we were wired to worry as much as we're that way. We have such capacity for being resilient and adaptive. You know, like we, one thing I think we can talk with the listeners about on an, and, and to encourage people to think on an ongoing basis, how we can keep coming up with the new normal. What's the new normal? Like, what do we need each day to find the new normal. And I used to talk with, I had some young um, patients who were very physically ill, who had so many life-threatening illnesses. And I used to work with them and they taught me so much about what I know about learning. You know, here young people are supposed to not worry about being old and and life being, you know, tragedy and and, um, catastrophe. What I learned with and through them is how to decide what the new normal is. And a new normal could be, what do I need to be okay today? You know, for me, it could be, I need to get out of the house and walk for 45 minutes. I need to binge watch Tiger King, you know, whatever it is. I need to dress my dog in a silly way. I need to talk to you, lady. I was so looking forward to this afternoon Mm -hmm. to be able to talk. I feel like we're like, we're best BFFs already, you know, just to the, the, the climbing into this experience becomes like, you know, flow, like I, you know, these things that really truly matter. Mm -hmm. So we can decide every day you know, how do we make do with what is to create a new normal and a new normal that needs to shift as things shift, you know? I was just talking to my partner yesterday about this very topic because 
I said a lot, the collective of the U.S. is used to routine scheduling. I get in my car, I drive to work, I come home, I have dinner, I go to bed, and maybe there's some things in between. And then the weekends are with the kids or the weekends are spent doing maybe honoring some, doing some self-care or whatever, whatever comes up there. But the only constant that really is in life for all humans is change. That's mm-hmm. the only thing that we really can anticipate. And it's an important time. I love the redefining normal or uh, I, how did you say it? You said it much more eloquently. What is the new normal today? What do I need what, to survive today? Yeah. yeah. And that can be sexually too, because that's what people are always asking us. Is this normal? Am I normal? And it's, we can redefine normal every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with and through the fact that we are now having to interrupt automatic habits. Automatic habits are good to a point, but a lot of what is creating our distress before the coronavirus is the habits of distraction, the habits of acquisition, the habits of consumption without savoring, without being connected. You know, we, oh yeah, people were out in public all the time, but they weren't even fucking paying any attention to each other. They were plugged into their devices, you know? So like you can be more connected virtually with another human being if you're really looking at them when you're talking, whether, you know, FaceTiming or Zooming or whatever, than you are with somebody in the room when you're not there. So this is really about, break. you know, interrupting habits is what I think is really going to be one of the most beneficial things for all of us is that we will then need to be, or we can, we have the opportunity to be a little bit more intentional. And people are finding new ways. Again, as April was saying, with the change and the times. I mean, I know folks who their whole career was based on large groups and in-person events. And now they're doing in virtual events where people are all dancing online together with 100 people in a Zoom room. And I know people used to do you know big group sex parties and now they're doing it online over video. And it's just like these times of of, you know, like you said, survival, adapting, applying the tools, this opportunity, I think looking at, um, uh, and I can speak for myself, I don't always look at it as an opportunity. I'm like, ah, fuck, fuck, this, this is really hard. And, but in those moments when I can be like, okay, but what's the opportunity here? What's the, ch- the opportunity here for shift and growth and this new reframing, this new way of being based on the change that is inevitable and that's always happening. Um, this is all so helpful. And I can't wait to have you back. Maybe we should, I think we should have you back like every month. <laughs> well, we're going to have you back answering sex questions yeah. too, because want sex and relationship questions, any particular challenges, any of you guys, not you two personally, but anybody who's listening is having, you know, it, and you know, what's really nice about being able to answer real people's questions is that other listeners will coattail on there. You know what I'm so, saying? And perhaps if our listeners want Dr. Nan to answer a question, you can just, you can put that in the subject line or somewhere in the question when you send it to us and we can save it for when she's back on the air with us because she is just fantastic. I love, I could talk to you all day, not that you would have time for that, but you're just like, I feel like you are like a new best friend of, of mine and Amy's. I love you, Dr. Nan. I love you both. You're just such brilliant. I'm just... I'm encouraged when I see uh, young people like you who have identified a need and also understood that being in touch with our sexual beings is really a very important part of our being empowered. And I wrote something for Shondaland that just came out today about sex and power and the masculine and feminine. You know, until we're equals in the bedroom, we're not going to be equals, you know, altogether. And claiming our pleasure and claiming the right to be sexually embodied and also embodied as pleasure beings who enjoy their bodies and their lives makes us much more powerful. And, and, you know, I remember watching, just, just seeing the name Shameless Sex And I thought to myself, like, really, you got, you ladies have it because most of what causes our issues is shame. It's shame about our sexuality, shame about our anxiety, shame about our feet, our bodies, our depression, or, you know, and, and really, you know, once we just kind of like realize that it's okay to be, here's the other thing. 
the radical acceptance. Let's wrap up with this note. Radical acceptance, just giving yourself full permission to be exactly as you are in this moment. My body starts to loosen. Mm -hmm. Full permission for this moment to be exactly as it is allows us to be where we are. And when we loosen and soften the tension and the anxiety and the the reaction to what is, and we are where, where we are, then we can be more resourceful. We can be more present. And just to let you know what I've been doing, because I've been, you know, feeling like I want to get, I'm doing a free, it's a 30 day thing. I'm putting out videos every day. I'll get, you know, I'll make this available to all of your listeners. I'll get my digital marketing people in connection with you guys so we can get it out. I'm also offering um, half price um, sessions for people or sliding scale if they're having trouble, if they want to have like a, you know, core boot camp just or just like a session to kind of work on whatever it is they are. My heart goes out. I mean, like, I'm I'm 62 years old. I already have grandchildren. Like my life, I'm figuring like not that I'm looking to trade my life for, you know, young people or anything. And, you know, I look at young people now with the challenges ahead of them. And I, I believe that you guys are going to make this world better because I think that there's so many really inventive, smart, look at the, what people are doing with 3D printers. Mm-hmm. Making these devices. I mean, the future's up to you guys. And I think you're, this is going to be a wake up call for everybody. What's your website to book sessions and to get more info about you ask, and Instagram? DrNan.com. It's just doctor spelled out. And they can book a free 15 minute session with me. They, I'm going to have all of this. And we're going to be putting the, the um, videos onto YouTube channel. So each day for 30 days, or they can watch them in any, you know, as they can watch them all together, if they, we get to that point, um, giving a tool, a technique, a strategy for not just thrive, not just surviving, but thriving through this, using this as an opportunity. Like for me, by the way, I'm going to be more fit than I've been. I'm <laughs> back. I'm down to my fighting weight because I gain weight with the dissertation babies in the book and the three papers. <laughs> I'm down to my fighting weight, and I'm gonna. I'm going into like better training. I'm walking and biking and doing the elliptical in my basement. At the end of this, I'm going to be probably metabolically 10 years younger, just from enjoying doing what I love, which is working out that I now have the priority to do. So, you know, we have this time and also to be able to reach out to as many people and, and kind of be in that, you know, giving people tools and tips and benefits and all of that, we can, you know, band together and help. So thank you for having me. Yeah, we love you so much. And to our listeners, a reminder, Nan was on episode 146 was the last time she was here. Oh, your little dog is so cute. We love you both. You are amazing. Oh yeah, I'll take a picture. Hold on a second. We will. And to all of our listeners out there who love our show, we love five-star reviews on iTunes. And you know what? We read them all and we just absolutely lights our, lights our hearts, especially the five stars. And if you like wine as much as Amy and I do, check out marginswine.com. There's actually coupon codes if you order six bottles or a case um, for being a shameless sex listener. They're boutique small batch wines. She runs out often. So get on the newsletter list, marginswine.com. You will love it. Dr. Nan, we love you. You're coming back to answer sex questions probably in a few weeks. So stay tuned. You let me know how I can help anybody and of your listeners come get come i'm always happy to help okay oh, you're you're the best dr nan and to our listeners thank you for being part of the shameless sex revolution we'll see you next tuesday and next friday because we're doing two episodes a week now so ciao for now don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.